That didn't scare me. I just, I don't know what happened. I just fainted. I was frightening. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, Jesus. If she ain't out here, he's winning. Hitman is one of the most grossest movies uh -huh. in the world. It is. I ain't never took my coat and hit it over my face like that. <laughs> Seriously, man. It really was. I fainted like 10 minutes after the first beginning of the movie. And I walked out and they gave me some water. <laughs> I passed out in, in about the first half hour, yeah. yeah. I think it's disgusting. Why? I don't know, it's just, it's just, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make me want to get sick like everybody says. It just, my legs are just going, Neh. and I want to go in the lobby and not watch it, and I have to cover my ears. <laughs> I can't even describe it. It's so horrible. It just, are you guys I don't know why I waited it four hours to see that. <laughs> I've seen The Exorcist about 167 times, and it keeps getting funnier every single time I see it! Welcome to Cinema Stories, a show about what it takes to make film history. I'm Tyler, and today we're taking a look at the madness that happened after The Exorcist was released in 1973. I'd like to thank cinema streaming service Mubi for sponsoring this episode. Try Mubi free for 30 days by clicking the link in the description. The Exorcist was the first horror movie nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards, and is often said to be the scariest movie of all time. But if you're like me, you grew up in a world where The Exorcist was already a classic, and you've probably already seen the references and parodies before actually watching the movie. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, Everlasting God. Your mama so soft and smell. Maggie, don't let the beetle pups bite. But just how scary was The Exorcist to audiences of 1973? This is the story of how The Exorcist got under America's skin. News on the march. The year is 1973 in France. Famed Spanish artist Pablo Picasso dies at home from heart failure at the age of 91. Unable to find a camera, police make this sketch of the scene. In Canada, construction has started on the CN Tower, which will stand at over 1,800 feet when completed. The project is said to be an attempt to vaccinate the sky against polio. But enough of that. It is Christmas time, and you know what that means. Oscar winner William Friedkin's adaptation of The Exorcist is set to hit theaters on December 26th. Early reviews say the movie is so scary, it'll make your head spin. Instead of ripping off old movies like The Exorcist. It's not a ripoff, it's a homage. The Exorcist follows a single mother named Chris and her 12-year-old daughter, Reagan. Chris and Reagan are living in Georgetown while Chris works as an actress on location for a movie. Ellen Burstyn actually researched being an actress for several years before production began. Chris begins hearing noises coming from the attic, and then little Reagan begins acting strange, and seems to have some strong opinions about the space program. You're gonna die up there. After putting Reagan through a variety of medical tests, it slowly becomes apparent that she is possessed by a demon named Pazuzu. Ah! Keep away! The soul is mine! <laughs> Kids. The Exorcist was based on a novel by William Peter Blatty. Blatty actually got his start in comedy, writing comedy books and even scripts like 1964's A Shot in the Dark. In the early 70s, he began researching possession and demonology a pursuit that resulted in a not funny book about Could it be Satan? Vladdy's project was likely driven by a personal interest in religion. At one time, he considered becoming a Jesuit priest. Vladdy based the book mainly on a 1949 exorcism case involving a 14-year-old boy, in which the boy yelled obscenities in ancient languages while pictures, chairs, and the boy's bed would move without any apparent cause. Oh my god long red scratches seemed to appear on the boy's body while he was strapped to his bed. And after exhausting all other options, the boy was finally taken to St. Louis for an exorcism. 
The Jesuit priest who performed the exorcism kept detailed notes in a diary that somehow found its way to Blatty. The diary was meant to be a guide for other priests, but Blatty claimed that he also had a letter from the priest that said, quote, The case was the real thing. I had no doubt about it then. I have no doubt about it now. The book was a smash hit, appearing on the Times bestseller list for 55 weeks and selling over 5.5 million copies throughout a dozen different languages. It was decided to push the story's success even further with a movie adaptation. Blatty, already a Hollywood vet at this point and protective of his work, handled the movie deal himself. The movie initially opened to varied responses by critics. According to the New York Times, there were eight positive reviews, four mixed reviews, and eight negative reviews. Vincent Canopy actually wrote two separate scathing reviews of the movie in the Times. But even while critics were denouncing it, they made sure to cash in with stills from the movie on the cover of their magazines. Media outlets, whether they liked the movie or not, would lead with Exorcist headlines and photos. Film Common even published pirated stills, most likely of the makeup effects which Friedkin had banned from all promotional materials. Newsweek was actually sued for, quote, publishing photos of Blair in demon makeup, which were apparently snapped from a screen during a showing. With the reviews in and the media buzzing, the stage was finally set for the public to experience the movie. But no one could have expected just how extreme audiences across the country would react. Did you expect the uh, phenomenon you created? I expected the novel to be a smash. I knew that when I was halfway through the writing of it. Uh, when I saw the rough cut of uh, the film, I expected it to be a powerful and very well received film, a hit. But I had no idea it was going to be the phenomenon that it turned out to be. But first, a message from our sponsor, Mubi. Mubi features a lineup of great movies, and they are always adding new ones. What's really cool is that all of their titles are handpicked by fellow cinephiles and they often curate releases into retrospectives, specials, and specific subgenres. Coming up in November, they have a John Carpenter double feature, The Fog and Escape from New York. But you won't want to escape New York just yet because Mubi has this new thing coming out called Mubi Go, where they've teamed up with indie theaters to handpick a screening for you to go to every week. All you have to do is pick a theater and a showtime, and Mubi will send you a code to pick up your ticket at the box office. It's starting here in New York at the end of October, and we'll be going nationwide soon. But right now, I'm gonna watch this movie called Demons, which looks totally insane. Will you survive it? Demons. You can watch it too by going to movie.com slash cinematyler and getting 30 days for free. That's mubi.com slash cinematyler for a whole month of great cinema for free. Or join Cinematyler on Patreon at the $5 level and get extended access to movie as a perk. Now, back to the show. Even though critics were divided, the intense audience reaction blew the negative reviews out of the water. The movie set attendance records, with filmgoers waiting in line for over four hours in harsh winter weather. Scalpers sold their place in line for outrageous sums, and Warner Brothers discovered that they didn't need much ad publicity because the turnout quickly overshadowed any negative publicity from critics. Warner only spent $80,000 on the movie's New York opening, and they had to add more theaters to the movie's run in order to meet public demand. I love it. Try it, you'll like it. <laughs> well, we drove 100 miles, so I hope so. Fantastic movie. It's really gross. <sighs> it was really terrific. Yeah. I want to see if it's going to make me throw up. In Washington, D.C., even senators couldn't get reserved seats. People lit fires along the street to keep warm while they waited in line and fights would sometimes break out. Uniformed guards were hired to maintain order in the lines that would stretch far away from the theater. And the movie's powerful effect was sensationalized even further by news stations broadcasting the insanity. Audiences resorted to desperate and even violent means in order to see the movie. In one particularly extreme case, a crowd that had been waiting for hours outside the Paramount on a cold February evening actually mobbed the theater, forcing the venue to cancel the screening. We've had uncontrollable crowds, and to try and alleviate some of the problems of, of people not getting tickets that have been waiting long periods of time in line, we started a system of giving out coupons 
uh, nobody gets a ticket without a coupon, and the way they get them is just by taking a place in line, waiting from three to five, five and a half hours, and then purchasing their ticket with it. So why were people so desperate to get into this movie, despite the lack of advertising or glowing reviews? Give me the 750 features just sold out. If you want to wait for the 10 o'clock feature, tickets, tickets go sell at 830. Well, besides cars, people were also driven to the movie by their curiosity. A lot of bizarre stories began coming out about the extreme reactions people were having. There were reports of audience members fainting, vomiting, and leaving the film screaming and shaking. I don't like it. I want to go home. It makes my heart beat too fast. I don't know. It doesn't bother me that much. But I guess it bothered her more than it bothered me. This is the second time we've seen it. We still can't hack it. No. Why? <laughs> I'm not going back in there. A theater division manager in Berkeley, California said, We've had two to five people faint here every day since this picture opened. More men than women pass out, and it usually happens in the evening performance, after the crucifix scene. The audience member most disturbed by the crucifix scene was this man. At one Berkeley showing, a man attacked the screen in an attempt to fight the demon. There were also some serious physical traumas reported including heart attacks and one miscarriage. Theater managers claim to keep smelling salts on hand, as well as kitty litter, to absorb the vomit. Doors and curtains had to be replaced after being damaged in the chaos. Some viewers couldn't sleep and experienced lasting effects, seeking out psychiatric help after seeing the movie. In some areas, there was a spike in church attendance, with priests seeing a growing number of people seeking exorcisms. Yes, hi, I'd like an exorcism, please. Hold, please. In response to the surge of people seeking psychiatric help after seeing The Exorcist, and perhaps also because of the portrayal of doctors, some in the medical and psychiatric communities criticized the movie. Well, uh, don't want to sound like a dick or nothing, but uh, it says on your chart that you're fucked up. One psychiatrist was quoted saying, There's no way you can sit through that film without receiving some lasting negative or disturbing effects. And a UCLA professor stated that the movie was, quote, a menace to the mental health of our community. Interestingly, the professor specifically pointed to the culture of the 1970s as a reason behind the movie's overwhelming impact. He continued saying, In the days when we all had more trust in our government, our friends, and ourselves, The Exorcist would have been a bad joke. Today, it's a danger. And uh, judging from my long night in the lobby, the people most susceptible to being profoundly upset by the film are those who went in believing in the devil, Roman Catholics especially. As a matter of fact, the Pope himself is being quoted as part of the film's publicity campaign. Demonology, he said, is an important part of Catholic doctrine that really ought to be studied again. Yeah. Do, you, do you believe in it? Well, I'm a Catholic. It makes me want to go to church. I thought it was excellent. I really did. I thought it was very good. Did you believe it could happen? Oh, yes. Anything's possible. <laughs> Possession uh, by the devil? Well, I'm not saying it has happened, but I'm not saying it hasn't either. Unsurprisingly, some of the harshest objections to the movie came from the Catholic Church and other religious groups. In D.C., Methodist evangels handed out leaflets to people in massive theater lines asking whether they want to be, quote, controlled by the spirit of darkness or by the spirit of God. One publication called The Christian Century called the movie repulsive and commercially exploitative, saying that the movie, quote, uses the human fear of evil to create an emotional response and then provides by our Protestant standards a completely impossible solution. And some church groups even staged burnings of the novel. Reverend Billy Graham, who had read the novel and tore it up and flushed it on the toilet, publicly refused to see the movie, saying, I would be opening myself up to satanic forces. I think we are dealing with a very dangerous and very strange situation. I don't believe believers can be possessed by the devil. Well, it seems to me that it touches um, very deep areas of the human personality. And uh, unless one is very insensitive, I can't imagine anyone either reading the book or seeing the movie without it having some reaction on them. One fundamentalist said, there are spiritual powers at work during the showing of that film. It is setting the stage for the future attack of Satan. Of course, this is preposterous. Satan had been found dead in his apartment from a glue-sniffing incident way back in 1939. However, not everyone in the church hated the movie. One reverend stated that the only problem with the movie was the hysteria it caused. 
especially by pushing people to seek needless exorcisms, and that the content of the movie was not itself immoral. One Los Angeles priest was quoted saying, If it makes people think about the meaning of good and evil for an hour, it'll do more good than a lot of religious study programs. And for some, the biggest issue was simply that Father Karras hadn't said mass correctly. That said, director William Friedkin had used three Catholic priests as technical advisors and had even given one of them a role. In fact, it was the participation of these priests, rather than the movie's content, that drew criticism from some people because it was taken as an implied endorsement of the movie by the church. One other point of criticism was the MPAA's decision to give the movie an R rating rather than an X. At this point, the MPAA and its letter rating system were still pretty new, and some suspected that Warner Brothers must have used some sort of political maneuver to secure the relatively lenient R rating. But this was denied by MPAA head Jack Valenti, who noted the thematic need for foul language and that there was no overt sex or excessive violence. Stick your c burst, you m worthless. Oh, come on, what's the matter with you? I'm eating here! Regardless, many felt that an R rating simply didn't go far enough. The district attorney's office in Boston and Washington, D.C. imposed their own X ratings, and the movie was banned on TV and home video for 25 years in Great Britain. In a somewhat surprising move, the Catholic Conference, which was usually stricter than the MPAA, gave the movie a relatively unharsh A4 rating, meaning that the movie is intended for adults and is moral, but may offend some viewers. For his part, director William Friedkin was surprised by the controversy and extreme reactions, saying, I'm shocked that that happened. I thought that people might be moved by the film. I never thought they would become hysterical or start screaming or fainting. That was never in my wildest imagination. I can't understand, I don't know what to say about that. Friedkin also noted that Warner Brothers didn't seem to anticipate the movie's impact either, and that they supported his vision entirely, saying, they loved it, period. I never got any other reaction. Some of the people in the studio had similar reactions to people in the audience. They couldn't sleep, but no one ever asked me to change it. It seems that in Friedkin's mind, the scares were secondary to the greater themes. In fact, neither Friedkin nor Blatty considered The Exorcist a horror movie. I know that it is considered by a great many people as a horror film. I've never thought of it that way, and I didn't approach it that way. It's a story about the mystery of faith. Next, why were so many people disturbed by The Exorcist when it came out? I mean, it's not that scary, especially if you don't believe in demonic possession. Well, the answer may or may not surprise you. How the hell should I know? So what made The Exorcist so scary to the people of 1973? Well, the first thing you have to realize is that the audiences of 1973 didn't have access to an endless amount of movies on home video or streaming. If you wanted to see the movie, you'd pretty much have to go to a theater. There was no internet available, so no easy access to clips, spoilers, and breakdowns. To really understand what all the fuss was about, you had to see it for yourself. But perhaps the most important condition for a movie like The Exorcist to shock and terrify this many people was the cultural mindset of Americans in the early 1970s. There had never before been a presidential scandal bigger than Watergate and it left the American people disillusioned and mistrustful of their own government. Because people have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. Much like the upstairs bedroom in the McNeil's home, there was a feeling that an evil entity had worked its way into a place of dignity and trust. The Vietnam War was notoriously controversial and spurred the largest anti-war movement the United States had seen, mostly led by young people associated with the counterculture hippie movement. The 60s had ended with the Manson murders, which in addition to being a shocking tragedy, twisted the hippie image from one of peace and love to one of cults and death. Well, Jesus, I guess I'm your best friend. Many conservative Americans were disturbed by the hippie movement, which they saw as an epidemic of rebellious children that threatened the sanctity of the home and was causing the breakdown of the nuclear family. But it's nothing a little Ritalin can't fix. The condition isn't quite what it seems. Nobody knows the cause of hyperkinetic behavior in a child. The Ritalin seems to work to relieve the condition. The transformation of the all-American girl next door to something so obscene seemed to be an attack on the American dream itself and possibly personified the anxiety around youth culture. In January of 1973, just under a year before the movie was released, 
the Supreme Court ruled on the case of Roe v. Wade, securing the right to abortion. Good evening. In a landmark ruling, the Supreme Court today legalized abortions. The majority in cases from Texas and Georgia said that the decision to end a pregnancy during the first three months belongs to the woman and her doctor, not the government. The national conversation around this controversial ruling, and inevitably sex in general, had emotions running high on both sides, with one side seeing an innocent young girl being sexually perverted by evil, and the other side seeing a loss of bodily autonomy, and in the infamous crucifix scene, the church forcing its ideals onto a young girl. Terrifying people of opposing ideologies at the same time is a great strategy if you want to reach a mass audience. This anxiety also concerned the fading respect for religion. In November of 1972, Pope Paul VI gave an address on the subject of evil and the devil. He said, Evil is not merely a lack of something, but an effective agent, a living spiritual being, perverted and perverting. In doing so, the Pope inadvertently gave free publicity to the movie by renewing an interest in the idea of Satan. However, if anything, the movie seems to endorse a return to these values because it depicts a clear good versus evil. And I'm the devil. Now kindly undo these straps. A movie phenomenon like this had happened once before. In 1931, people ran screaming from theaters showing this terrifying sight. This is the story you've heard about, talked about. The spine-tingling, blood-chilling story that stuns your emotions. Frankenstein. Some theaters had ambulances standing by with smelling salts for audience members who passed out from the horror on screen. Apparently, a scene in which the monster interacts with a young girl was so terrifying that it was cut from the American version after Backlash, and parents demanded the movie only play to adults. The Exorcist marked a shift in the film industry during the 1970s. Warner Brothers had conceived of the movie in some ways as a high art picture, but marketed it as a high-concept exploitation movie. The one hope. The only hope. The Exorcist. High-concept is a film marketing term that means that the movie can be condensed to a single idea. In this case, Little Demon Girl. Despite the chaos it inspired, or more likely because of it, the movie was hugely successful and quickly became regarded as a classic. The Exorcist took home 14% of the January 1974 box office and was the third highest grossing movie of the 1970s behind Jaws and Star Wars respectively. The buzz around the movie spurred sales of the novel making it the second all-time best-selling paperback as of 1974. 3.5 million copies of the book were sold in just the first five weeks following the movie's premiere. The Exorcist was nominated for 10 Oscars, but only won two, Best Sound Recording and Screenplay. Warner Brothers had expected more and Blatty was pissed, publicly slamming the Academy and blaming the losses on an alleged smear campaign by George Cukor. During the 70s, it was becoming more and more expensive to make movies, and theatrical attendance was in decline. The response to this problem from most studios was to produce fewer movies per year and heavily market them to broad audiences to create perception of the movies as must-see events. These were referred to as tentpole movies because the studios were being held up by these few projects each year. Because of the need for these movies to be guaranteed hits, studios began to almost exclusively focus on projects with elements already proven to be successful, such as pre-sold properties. In this case, a novel. From the makers of Little Girl Possessed by Demon the Book comes Little Girl Possessed by Demon the Movie. The overwhelming cross-demographic success of film adaptations like The Exorcist Jaws, and The Godfather proved this was a viable approach and signaled the transition from the new Hollywood era to the blockbuster era. Was there a movie too scary for you to finish the first time you watched it? I'm afraid. What was it? Leave a comment down below or tweet using hashtag CinemaStories. For me, I'd have to say Lars von Trier's Antichrist. I mean, I still haven't finished it. This episode's Patreon After Show features my dad, who was 17 when The Exorcist came out, telling his story about going to see the movie a few times, but never making it to the end. That's when I immediately stood up from my chair. I walked down the stairs, and I left the theater. Click the link to check it out for $1, and it'll go into the $5 archive when my next video goes up. 
Your support really helps this channel. And if you haven't seen it yet, check out my video on Stalker, the sci-fi masterpiece that killed its director. Thanks for watching.